Thank you. Um, so I'm here to talk today about uh, nutritional psychiatry and the connection between diet and depression. Um, so I first got interested in this uh, when I was working with individuals with chronic pain and inflammation. And I was working with them on changing their diets to reduce inflammation. And what was happening that was a surprise to me was after about two to three weeks, individuals were coming back and they were saying that their mood and their energy was better. And the changes to mood and energy were preceding any changes or shifts at all to pain. So it really caught my attention because a lot of these people were already diagnosed with depression, they were on medications for depression, and really hadn't had an adequate response from their medications and treatments that far, thus far. Um, and yet the dietary changes were making some shifts in their mood. So I did a little bit more research, and indeed there was actually a lot of research, published research, on the connection between inflammation and depression, and diet and depression. And this is how I stumbled upon this whole field of nutritional psychiatry. Um, so a lot of the research uh, initially were um, what we would call epidemiological studies, where there was a connection between certain diets and developing depression. Um, and there's more prospective studies and also some randomized trials. So I'm going to actually get into some of the research with you now. So most of the research has been on the Mediterranean diet, and the MIND diet is a Mediterranean diet. Um, there are three meta-analyses showing that a Mediterranean diet can reduce the risk of depression uh, by about 30%. So this is a correlational study. Uh, the diet, initially diets are associated with decreased risk of depression. And for those of you that want a visual, um, this is what a Mediterranean diet looks like. And I think the, the important thing to notice here is that the foundation of the diet is really plant-based foods. So we have lots of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, um, legumes, nuts and seeds, some olive oil. And this is really the foundation. So this, this is what people are eating every day. Um, and then we've got some fish, uh, some processed dairy and processed grains. And at the top, you can see lean animal protein. Um, so the question is, is we, we know that these that there's epidemiological evidence showing that um, following this diet can reduce your risk of depression, but the question is, can a Mediterranean diet actually treat depression? And Felice Jacka, uh, who is a psychologist in Australia, designed a trial to answer this question, and this was published in 2017. So she did a controlled, randomized trial where she recruited individuals that had major depression that was either moderate or severe in intensity, a um, total of 67 people, and 55 of these people were receiving either medication or therapy or both, and they had not adequately responded. So they still had moderate to severe depression despite treatment. And so half of the people were randomized to receive um, to receive uh, a Mediterranean diet, and the other half were randomized to receive or to attend a social group. Um, so in order to get into the study, they had to be eating a poor diet, so what we would call a Western or standard American diet. And that is a diet that's high in what I would like to call food-like substances. And they're basically not food, but it looks like food, and we eat it all the time here. So things like, um, French fries, things that were deep fried, high processed foods, processed meats, salty snacks, that come in packages. And I think the key thing is what's missing. So, what's missing is the dietary fiber, the fruits and vegetables, and the main protein. Uh, so, they had to get rid of all of those foods. They had to eliminate the sweets, the refined cereals, the fast food, the fried food. Uh, and instead, um, vegetables and fruits every day. Um, whole grains and beans, olive oil and nuts and seeds every day, and then they could have a minimum of two servings of fish. They were able to have some dairy that was not sweetened, so no added sugar, wasn't high fat dairy, and then some lean chicken and red meat a couple times during the week. Um, and what were the results? Um, keep doing this. So the results were at <coughs> Week 12, so three months, one third of the group that received the diet, um, the Mediterranean diet, actually were in remission. And this was compared to 8% of the people who achieved remission in the social group. 
Um, and when you compare the diet to placebo, you needed to treat four people with the diet in order to get one person into remission. And when we compare this to our antidepressant treatments, this is actually pretty good numbers. So with antidepressants, the best we may see is we need to treat seven people to get one person into remission. Um, the other thing was that there were improvements in anxiety. It wasn't statistically significant, but there was a trend towards um, improvements in anxiety. And when they were looking at what are the other potential confounding factors, they were actually able to, to determine that it wasn't due to changes in weight. The results were not due to changes in weight. They weren't due to changes in self-efficacy. They weren't related to smoking or physical activity. It was the change in the diet. OK, so why does a Mediterranean diet help depression? And this really gets back to the elements of the Mediterranean diet, um, very nutrient dense, and a lot of anti-inflammatory properties. So when you actually look at inflammatory potential of foods, certain foods actually are linked with inflammation, and, and others are less so. And the foods in the Mediterranean diet are linked with lower levels of inflammation. And that's in comparison to the Western diet, which is, tends to be more pro-inflammatory. Um, as well, the Mediterranean diet has a positive effect on the microbiota. Um, so I'm going to get into a little bit more um, of some theories about why the Mediterranean diet may be having an impact on inflammation. Um, and so the first thing that I wanted to talk about was the leaky gut hypothesis Depression. So this is a Scientific American journal um, caption, and this was published in 2013, and there's actually been a lot of research since then. And the idea here is that um, if you have leaky gut, and I'll explain what that is in a second, that it can lead to inflammation. So when you think about the, the GI tract, it's basically this long hollow tube that extends from the mouth down to the anus. And we're bringing a lot of things into this too, things that from the environment, so food, um, bacteria, viruses. And we don't want all of these things to necessarily enter our bloodstream because when they do enter the bloodstream, the immune system recognizes them as, as foreign and potentially dangerous and will amount to immune response, which is basically creating inflammation. So um, in particular, when the gut is healthy, the junctions are tight and, and bacteria and parts of bacteria don't enter into the bloodstream. But if we have um, gaps or what we call leaky gut, so gaps in the junctions so that um, bacteria can enter, what tends to happen is there's a particular particle that's been studied called lipopolysaccharide, which is on gram-negative bacteria, it's on the cell walls. It enters the bloodstream and it starts an immune cascade. Uh, so what might cause this? Well, it actually may be the food that we're eating. So remember I mentioned the Western diet is associated with increased levels of inflammation. Uh, we know that fast food, processed foods, and saturated fats can lead to leaky gut. And I, I want to comment here, it's not just foods, it's also stress. And I think we all have seen that stress is often a trigger for people with chronic depression. So this may be one of the mechanisms by which that works. And this is just a national post uh, headline that shows our bodies being treating fast foods like it, like an invading bacterial infection. So I want to show, share one study that illustrates this. And this was a study that was uh, done with McDonald's. And uh, so individuals were randomized to either have a McDonald's breakfast, so an egg, egg muffin sausage sandwich with two hash browns, uh, or a high fiber breakfast. And what they did was they checked blood um, before the breakfast and one, two, three hours after the meal. And what they found was in the individuals that had the McDonald's breakfast, there was increased endotoxin, so bacterial particles from, or sorry, LPS from the bacteria, um, increased inflammation and increased oxidative stress. So this was having an impact on inflammatory status after the meal. And there was no such changes with the high fiber. So does that show that LPS causes depression? Uh, not, I don't think it does, it's an association, but we, we don't have a definitive data yet. Um, there definitely are some studies that show that if you inject LPS into humans, it can create low motivation and, and fatigue, but when the LPS is clear, the immune system 
settles down, the symptoms go away. There was one really interesting study in mice where they took a model and they basically um, in, in <clears throat> they injected LPS into the mice for five days a month for four months. And in this particular study, after four months, the female mice actually were showing signs of chronic depression, so behaviors associated with depression. Um, and it lasted, so it lasted for seven weeks, and, and it was reversible by treatment with Prozac. So that was kind of interesting. It only happened in the female mice. But it kind of gives you this idea that if someone were eating fast food and Western foods every day for several months, perhaps it could lead to chronic depression. Um, and then the final bit of evidence is there's again an association where a couple studies coming out in the last two years showing that individuals with depression, when you compare them to controls, to healthy individuals, that they do have higher amounts of LPS um, and inflammatory cytokines. So there's definitely a possible link there. So that may be one mechanism by which um, a Western diet could lead to depression and an uh, anti-inflammatory Mediterranean diet can help. So the other um, mechanism is related to the microbiome. And again, another Scientific American um, article. This was published in 2015. And I'm going to share um, two interesting studies. So one is uh, the fecal transplant. This is what uh, Dr. Gilman was alluding to. And um, in this particular study, what's remarkable about this is that stress were subjected to, or sorry, mice were subjected to, to stress, unpredictable stress. And they're no different than humans. When subjected to stress, they develop behaviors associated with depression and anxiety. Um, so this occurred um, after four weeks of stress. And what was interesting about this study was that they took samples of the feces and they found that there were changes in the microbiome. So a drop in lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. And these are important because these have been associated with anxiety and depression in both uh, mice rodent um, studies as well as human studies. They also found that there was an increase in inflammatory markers. And so the stress led to changes in the microbiome, increased inflammation, depression, and anxiety-like behaviors. So then the next step of the study was they took the feces from the stressed mice and they transplanted them into healthy mice. And they had a control group, so they also transplanted feces from healthy mice into healthy mice. And what they found was that they were able to transfer some of the depression and anxiety symptoms to these mice, as well as some of the inflammatory markers. They changed as well. So I think it's kind of interesting because it shows that some of the depression and inflammation may actually be coming from the feces, uh, from the microbiome. And not everything transferred perfectly, but uh, enough to make it um, significant. And there was one other study, similar, where they took feces from depressed humans and transplanted them into mice. Um, and compared this to a controlled transplant, and again, similar type of thing, but some of the behaviors, uh, some of the depressive behaviors were transferred, and some of the inflammatory behaviors. Again, not all, but some. So it really brings us to think that the microbiome does play a role uh, in depression and anxiety. Um, and I think what would, would be really interesting is to see if we had similar types of studies in humans, and I don't think we're there yet. So there was just one study in individuals with irritable bowel syndrome, and when they received a fecal transplant, um, some of their depressive symptoms improved. And there's definitely a lot of work we're looking at right now, like the differences in the microbiota between individuals with depression and healthy non-depressed individuals, and, and differences are coming up, so there are differences, but again, it's still in the early days and sort of figuring out what this means and what the mechanisms are. And then finally, there's some evidence from probiotic studies that when we give lactobacillus and bifidobacterium, that can have an impact on depression and anxiety in humans. Um, so there's lots of mechanisms, and I'm not going to get into them, but um, main thing to, to consider, I guess, really is the impact on the brain, the intestinal permeability, um, neurotransmitters. But I think what I want to focus on a little bit more is the diet, because I started this talk talking about how a Mediterranean diet can help depression, and that one of the mechanisms may be through the impact on the microbiota. 
And so one of the key features here about the Mediterranean diet is the high fiber. And what we know about high fiber diets is that um, they can increase these healthy bacteria, phytobacteria and lactobacillus. And so what, what happens with these high fiber diets is we can't fully digest the fibers, and so the fibers pass through the intestinal tract, and the bacteria start to ferment them. They produce things called short-chain fatty acids that can have anti-inflammatory um, effect on our body. So that's one of the mechanisms by which uh, Mediterranean diet can be helpful in treating depression. So again, just want to focus, bring it back to the diet, and the foundation there, as you can see, it's fiber, lots of fiber. And so um, when we're working with individuals and helping them change the diet, we really want to focus on getting into a high fiber diet with lots of vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, beans. Um, one of the prebiotics that's particularly helpful apparently is inulin, and so that comes in uh, vegetables again. Um, and the other thing to consider is whether introducing Fermented foods can help um, with the microbiota. And there have been any studies that are linking fermented foods to depression or treating depression. But when you think about it, um, fermented foods are basically bacteria that are living in, in vegetables and digesting the vegetables, and then we end up eating them. And they colonize our gut. So um, that's another way that people could potentially improve their microbiota. Um, so I just wanted to summarize with the elements of a Mediterranean or anti-inflammatory diet. So the key thing here is really eliminating the processed foods and the fast foods and the sugars um, and focusing on the healthier uh, foods. So lots of plants and vegetables, healthy fats that don't cause the gut, the protein intake, uh, lots and lots of fiber. And in summary, I think um, I just want to point out that our understanding of depression is changing. Um, so I don't think we can really think about it as something that's occurring just from the neck up. Um, the health of the gut and the microbiome are increasingly important factors to consider. And also whether or not a person ha has inflammation. So again, if we're thinking about inflammation, we're thinking about is the diet causing it, uh, is stress causing it, and treatment may focus more on interventions that are designed to reduce inflammation, um, to reduce stress, so prescription of an anti-inflammatory diet, looking at other treatments that reduce stress and inflammation, like exercise and meditation. And then finally, I think we're going to probably be seeing more emphasis on directly changing the microbiome or the microbiota. And I'll just close with this image, which is from, again, the National Post. And this was referring to potential of using fecal transplants to treat depression. And there are some studies actually underway, so the results aren't out yet. Um, but I'll leave you with a quote here that no area of, of psychiatry is as hot or controversial today as the idea of manipulating the gut to alter the mind. That's it.